I heard his footsteps following me and I was heading for the end of the road and as I walked faster I could hear his footsteps getting faster and faster and then sheer panic took over and I started to run towards the end of the road and as I ran I could feel his his steps getting nearer and nearer and nearer so close behind me I had the hairs on the back of my neck standing up and my knees went to jelly. So it was 25th of October and I'd planned to go into town to meet my friends uh, on a Saturday night, as we usually did, just for a few beers. Leeds was a really vibrant town, full of music venues, arty people. Uh, my boyfriend at the time went on a CND march, which was a campaign for nuclear disarmament. Um, so I was on my own, which was fine. And um, I got ready, I got the flat all tidy, so it was nice when I came back and went to meet my friends to plan my 21st birthday party, which was up and coming in a few days' time. There was an atmosphere in Leeds at the time whereby you didn't want to stay out late and women were encouraged not to go out alone. Well, I wasn't having any of that as a 20-year-old. I just thought that was ridiculous. And I felt very safe and streetwise. So my friends decided that we should leave the pub early um, we'd run out of money, to be fair, we'd only had enough money for a few beers. And then I separated from them to walk into the town centre to catch my bus home. So they were fretting a bit, saying, are you going to be all right? You gonna... I was absolutely fine, there's nothing to worry about. I'm just going into town, catch a bus, get home to the flat, and I'll be okay. So I went on my own through the uh, Leeds University campus. There was a few people about wasn't particularly busy. I think people had already gotten home. And then I thought, if I don't hurry, I'm going to miss my bus. So I took a shortcut, which was only a side street. It wasn't an, an alley or anywhere dark. And then I heard this voice behind me, just here. It was a really friendly, friendly voice. And he said, hi, hi, how are you doing? I thought, I'm bound to know this person. They're probably en route into town like me or they're, you know, a fellow student. So I turned around and went and walked towards him. And as I got closer, I didn't recognise him at all. I noticed that he was holding himself really oddly, as though he, was, he had an arm around his side and he was leaning a little bit. But he really wanted to engage in conversation, that much I do remember. And I, I started to feel a little bit uncomfortable. And so I said, no, I'm sorry, yeah, bye, I've got to catch a bus. And I, I turned round and started to walk very quickly. Then I sensed real danger because I heard his footsteps following me and I was heading for the end of the road and as I walked faster, I could hear his footsteps getting faster and faster. And then sheer panic took over. And I started to run towards the end of the road. And as I ran, I could feel his, his steps getting nearer and nearer and nearer, so close behind me. I had the hairs on the back of my neck standing up and my knees went to jelly. And then I felt this massive blow to the top of my head. And I just saw, I just saw the ground coming up towards me and I was made completely unconscious. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. It's got to be said. Apparently, unbeknownst to me, as I don't remember anything apart from the blow to my head and falling to the ground, I let out a scream. Fortunately, uh, there was a young couple walking at the end of the road, right where I needed to get to. And then they saw me on the floor with this man kneeling over me, wielding something and trying to hit me repeatedly. And they ran towards him. And at that point, he saw them and ran away. And 
if it wasn't for them, he would have had his final blow and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be sat here today, for sure. What were the injuries you sustained? So the injuries that I sustained were I had two massive dents to the top of my head. Um, and my jaw was cracked open completely. I bit the side of my tongue, the inside of my mouth needed stitches. I had a fractured skull, fractured cheekbones and two um, puncture wounds to the nape, to the, the top of my top of my neck, just underneath my skull, which I learnt later had only just missed my spinal cord. These were uh, sharpened screwdrivers that he'd rammed up inside. While I was on the floor, basically, you know, I had a big, big gash on, on the side of my eye that needed stitching up and it was all about my head. My head was just full of cuts and bruises, scars and broken jaw and was pretty, pretty horrific to the point where when my parents eventually came to the hospital, um, they didn't recognise me. So I, I, I was in hospital bed thinking, there's mum and dad. And my dad had his cap in his hand and they were walking, there was only like four beds in this ward. And they were like, well, where is she? And I'm like, ah, I couldn't speak because my jaw was so, my, my face was so swollen. I was un unidentifiable and my hair was covered in blood, you know, so much blood. Um, I think they'd cleaned my face, but my hair was all matted. And, and then they saw me and I saw their faces and then I, I started to realise something very serious had happened to me. So at what point of time did you start realising who was the attacker? So following the injury and knowing that there was this man called the Yorkshire Ripper on the streets, I did not want to be associated with, with, that, with that kind of serial killer mass hysteria that was going on. At the time, the Yorkshire Ripper was seen as a, a, um, a serial killer who was cleaning up the streets of women who were, wor were working in the night. So it was for the sex industry, for women who were on the streets. And for some bizarre and twisted reason, the police in the early days thought, let him do it, let him carry on. He's doing society a favour. You know, these women aren't really worth that much. Their lives aren't, aren't worth anything. Um, and then he started to kill women, students, housewives, uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of women um, from all walks of life. At the time, they, they, the police, uh, they're called the, the Ripper Squad, were transported up from London and became the, the chief uh, superintendent who was head of the, the whole of the Ripper investigation. Uh, these four men uh, received a tape recording and it was taunting them that they couldn't find the Ripper. And they believed that this tape was from the Ripper himself. And they also received letters saying things like, you can't find me, Jack. It was very personal to the man who was, who was in charge of the, of the Ripper squad. And he, he took this very, very seriously. So he put all his eggs in one basket for this one tape recording and a few letters and decided to do this massive campaign all around the city where they, they magnified the, the letters and put them on billboards. Do you know this handwriting? They played the tapes in working men's clubs, shopping centres, on the bus. You could hear it everywhere. It was this Geordie accent saying, you'll never catch me, really, really taunting, very, very frightening. And then they started to interview everyone who had a Tyneside accent or a Geordie accent and dismissed what the officers on the ground were saying, that they knew that he wasn't a Geordie, that he was a Yorkshireman who had been this, uh, this serial killer. So the Ripper Squad decided to ignore all the men on the ground, all the detectives there, and every now and then, and I've learnt this most recently, when they did go to the Chief Constable at the time, 
they were told in no uncertain terms, if you mention that this was a Yorkshireman ever again, you, you, they were all young detectives, you're going back on traffic, you're going back on the beat, and that was it. So they were gagged. They couldn't, they couldn't communicate to the, the Ripper squad. They weren't having any of it. They invested all of their research into this, this hoax tape. But the police, in their wisdom at the time, so they thought, it would be best to really play down my attack because um, they were being um, heavily criticised by the media and the public and the government for not being able to, to find this serial killer. So um, they said it wasn't him. To me, it couldn't have been him. It was just a random attack. But that was to help them show that they weren't incompetent. So they played it right down and said it definitely wasn't the Yorkshire Ripper. How did it feel for you to be out there knowing that the man who attacked you wasn't caught? How, how did you get on with, the, with your life? So I returned from hospital after the intensive care and my jaw, I was wired up so I could not just speak like this. It was really difficult. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. They're not taking my my attack seriously. So that means there's someone out there who wants to finish me off because he didn't get to the point where he killed me because I managed to escape. So I tried to carry on, went back to the art studios. It was my final year. I had lots of etchings and printmaking to do and I did not want anything to get in the way of that. But deep down inside, I was really, really frightened and I carried on getting on the bus and I wouldn't go out at night. No one went out at night. The, you'd just meet up for a, a coffee in, in town during the day. And I became more and more uh, isolated and depressed, even though I was with my very caring boyfriend at the time. Two months after I was attacked, a young student was killed, and I do strongly believe that if they'd listened to me and investigated me and taken my case more seriously, that Jacqueline Hill would, have, would not have been attacked and they would have found who was then known as Peter Sutcliffe. They would have found him and, and put him under lock and key. I lost a lot of confidence, but I was doing my art degree, which is the thing that I loved, and that was that was what was keeping me going. But it, it was it was very demoralising to think that nothing was happening, and another person was attacked shortly after me, and then another, and uh, the students they put on their student buses to transport women around the town. Um, there was a reclaim the night march because we were all so in, so alarmed that Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister at the time, was saying, "You women, you shouldn't be going out on your own. You have to have, you know, you've got to be accompanied by a man, and it's it's ill-advised for you to go out alone." So the women of Leeds decided to um, do a reclaim the night march, and we went out and marched through the streets and said that it's in fact the men that should be uh, put into to keep at home and, and not the women. And it was quite a magnificent and very empowering statement which was broadcast nationally. How was he caught? Peter Sutcliffe was caught by accident by a Bobby on the beat who noticed that he had the wrong number plates on his car and uh, the policeman, you know, told him to pull over, asked him a few questions, noticed there was a young woman beside him in the car. Sutcliffe had decided he wanted to take a leak while he was being um, pressed with these charges against uh, the vehicle uh, condition. And the policeman went back and found screwdrivers and hammers that Sutcliffe had disposed of while he was being interviewed for this, uh, this car offence. And that's when, they, that's when they caught him.
So it was by accident and it was just by, it wasn't by detective work, it was just purely by accident. How did it make you feel when he was caught? Well, it was really strange when Peter Sutcliffe was caught. Of course, I, I honestly had no communication with the police. They weren't coming to me to say, yeah, we caught him, this is the man who tried to kill you because they said that it wasn't Peter Sutcliffe who'd attacked me. So I was still in a uh, frame of mind that my attacker was still out there. So I, I couldn't get over that. I didn't have any justice. I couldn't feel safe. And every time I went into town, I would get my keys and put a key through each finger and made a fist. So if I saw the man again that had attacked me, I would, you know, be able to, to attack him back. As the media went on and his face appeared on the screens, that's when I recognised. And I was at home alone in Liverpool recuperating from my, my injuries still. And I saw his face and I thought, that's the man. That's, that's the man who tried to, to talk to me and befriend me. I couldn't, I couldn't tell anyone. I was so frightened. What are people going to think? You know, me as a young art student, that I would been, I'd been attacked because they'd assumed that I was a, a prostitute. So I kept it hidden. And because the police weren't coming to me, I thought, well, it, it, is it him? And I started to doubt myself. And I thought the best thing to do would be to just go into denial, you know, Mo, that it's him. The police aren't saying anything. And I just, I did that for, for a number of years. Mum and Dad had no idea it was Sutcliffe. I didn't tell anyone about it. I told them about the attack, but I didn't say, I think it was by the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe. I did not want to be labelled as a victim of the Yorkshire Ripper, no way. I did wonder at some, point whether I was going to get that phone call from the West Yorkshire police to confirm deep down what I already knew. The, the police at the time were thinking, well, we've, we've got him, we've caught him. Uh, whoever else he attacked, we don't know. We've got some records of some people, and, uh, but that's not important because they're all right now, aren't they? About 10 or 12 years ago, he did confess to one young lady who he attacked. So they managed to get a confession out of him. And uh, Chief Constable Keith Hallowell did go to him and ask him uh, if he had attacked me. And the Chief Inspector knew, Sutcliffe knew, but Sutcliffe was not going to say anything. So he was holding his cards close to his chest and then he died about a year or so ago. And I knew, I knew he'd taken that secret to, the, to his grave. And that, that was pretty heartbreaking. And but I've had to accept that. But, you know, I never got a confession. So even in his prison cell, Sutcliffe did hold power over his other, other uh, assaults. And he knew full well what he'd done but he liked to just sit back and conduct his life in prison. I think it made him feel powerful that he'd attacked other women, but the police hadn't convicted him for it. And that's, I find, really sickening. Even though he was convicted for murder, he got away with assaults. He got away with, with the most disgusting crimes. And, and that, shouldn't have, that shouldn't have happened. There's a, a kind of outrage that while he did kill a lot of people, Sutcliffe, you know, murdered many women and attacked many women, there were even more that the police had brushed to one side and not taken their cases seriously. Because it's really, really hard to, to go through your life. The attack was one thing, being ignored by the police is another, but not being able to get justice and the respect and, and to be ignored that's, that just adds insult to injury, really, written in my books. It's, it's not good policing, to say the least, 
and it's certainly not victim-centred and it's certainly not helping women who've been affected by crime because what it, it indicates is that women who have who've been affected by violent crime are second-class citizens. If we'd all been men, I just wonder if we'd be sat here today protesting about the uh, injustice. Would you say that this attack changed your life? You know, I've been, I've had a lot of counselling over the years. Uh, it's made me less trusting of people. It's made me very cautious of men. Um, I did have a, a loving relationship with a woman for 28 years. Um, I'm single now, that's fine. But it did, it did shape me and it, but it, I think the most important thing that it did give me, that attack, that five minutes in the wrong place gave me the, uh, the power to just go, wow, I, I, was, I, could, I nearly died. I nearly died. I was so close to death and a horrific death it would have been as well, mutilated. I just, it gave me power, actually. It didn't, it's, it doesn't define me because I am other things than a victim of a crazy serial killer. You know, I'm a professional, I'm a practicing artist, I'm a published author. Sutcliffe couldn't take that away from me. He might have broken my bones and tried to kill me and, you know, the police didn't investigate and the shame of all of that. Uh, but it did change me because it gave me a lust for life. It gave me a uh, like, wow, I survived that almost a responsibility to carry on, you know, harder uh, and loud, to shout louder, to make big art, to do things. And I, I just wonder how I would have plodded on if, if I hadn't been attacked. Harness your anger, harness your, 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 your fear and, and turn it around if you can and use it as fuel to get you where you want to be in your life. It's really vital that you, you don't let it subsume you and drown you and define you. He got hold of me and uh, he said, we reckon there's probably about 30 victims. I went, no. I said, 500 victims? I said, that's probably what it's more like. And don't forget, I've been investigating Savile now for a year. 